We're the Wildlife Wire, and we are here with our next episode of Wildlife Biologists Rank the Animals of the Planet Zoo. Finally, I know it's been a long time coming, but we've been pretty busy, so we haven't gotten to around to recording the this episode. But my name is Dominic Noche. I received my bachelor's degree in wildlife biology from the University of Montana. I've worked on a variety of different projects with carnivores and ungulates, and I'm currently working on bobcats in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. And I'm Justin Ruby. I've graduated from the University of Montana with a bachelor's in wildlife biology. Um, I have worked as a research technician studying deer and currently working in education. So today we have the platypus, which is yes, a very we unique do. animal for sure. And one of Justin's favorite animals. So he's gonna be taking the lead today and telling us all about this amazing animal. So Justin, why don't you start off with telling us uh, what sort of little habitat you created for them here? So in this habitat, we've created obviously the platypus is from Australia. And for those who didn't know, it's from Australia, which I guess from the look of it, you could probably guess because Australia tends to have a lot of the weird looking animals. Um, and so right now we have a little snippet of a river system in we're going for like you know southern australia a river system that has you know vegetation on the riverbanks um not disturbed by humans so no development in this immediate area which as we will find out later can be important for the platypus um and so yeah so i guess we'll start off by talking about the platypus well, okay, this little guy is venturing very far. Um, he Wallace, is. the walking <laughs> is like it's it's kind of oddly like fast. Isn't yeah, it? like they're not really they're they're and even just like the way the I don't know it's kind of got some jank to a little to bit. Me they're surprisingly the fast. Although I do like yeah. you can see the bill is like touching the ground, which is cool yeah. because the platypus has electroreceptors on their bill that allows them to find their prey usually in the water or like in mud um, and that's why a lot of animals that have that are either aquatic or you know are digging around in the mud in places where there is moisture because that helps conduct the electricity from other animals and helps them find them so it's kind of cool that well now it, you know he isn't but mm -hmm. he's kind of mm -hmm. searching um, but on the yeah. topic of movement the uh, the platypus could actually move a surprising distance with males able to move up to 10 kilometers in a single night with females not okay yeah he is moving kind of janky i will uh agree with that now we're kind of seeing him yeah it's like the hips are kind of <laughs> a little weird um yeah i mean the textures look really good they do yeah it's they, just yeah they've got the like the little the little eye kind of spots yeah. um the bill looks really good the tail as well the fatty tail um which I was so kind of surprised to know is kind of almost, it's almost prehensile in a way, because I guess when they're moving nesting material, they actually grab the nesting material with oh. their tail. Um, and by nesting material, that may surprise some people to know that this animal lays eggs, or maybe not so surprising based on the bill. But what may be surprising is this is actually a mammal, um, and one of the few that lays eggs they're part of a special grouping of mammals called monotremes and this will include the echidna which you may not be familiar with um and if you're not it's worth a google uh because the echidna is a spiny um animal from australia and tasmania and i think new guinea as well if i remember correctly if you don't know what an echidna is, he is silently judging you <laughs> more than the platypus, just so you know. <laughs> They've just got, you know, we're still waiting for them in Planet Zoo. I don't care if it's the we short are. beaked or the long beaked, but they're, they're there is, well overdue. There is an audio file. There's a song that has the echidna's name. That's in. true. That's true. Still a chance. Yeah. So hopefully. we didn't get him in Oceana. Hopefully, Frontier, if you're listening, next pack, uh, uh, an echidna, please. Um, but yeah, so they're related to the platypus. 
So two very odd kind of animals in the same uh, grouping, monotremes. Um, being that these animals are mammals, they produce milk. Uh, unlike pretty much the rest of mammals, they basically secrete milk through their skin. So they basically sweat milk and they have little tufts of hair around the um, where they secrete the milk that kind of act like a, like a nipple or a funnel. So then when the, the puggle, the baby platypus is suckling, um, they're able to you know, direct the milk right to them. So they're not like licking the milk off of, like like just regular sweat. And Isn't it also like the milk's red, right? I believe so. Yeah, if I, if I remember yeah. correctly. I so, mean, the, the funny thing I always say with, with monotremes is that you can make an omelet out of them because they have milk and eggs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, they, they produce eggs. Um, the eggs take... I think around 12 days to incubate and hatch. Uh, the young stay with the mother in the den, and obviously they, they, you know, live off the milk. And then eventually they will leave the, they will leave the dens or the burrows, I should say. And let's see if I don't know if this platypus will get to the burrow, but we do have a burrow here. It's not quite accurate because burrows tend to be over a half a meter. A, like on a riverbank, so above the waterline, and with a tendency to have lots of overgrown uh, vegetation kind of almost covering it or concealing it. Because these guys, while they're very unique and really cool, they do have predators. So snakes will eat them, um, hawks will eat them, uh, invasive, I guess, some, you know, invasive species like foxes will also eat them. And I would also assume yeah. that uh, domestic feral cats would as well. Um, Domestic dogs definitely do. Yeah. There's not a whole lot on dingoes going after them, though, which I just imagine is, like, they will opportunistically, but it's mm -hmm. hard for them compared to, like, someone's dog where we artificially make the density higher yeah. by feeding them and stuff like that. In addition, these guys are really are pretty fast in the water, so as soon as they're in the water, most terrestrial predators, you know, won't be able to catch them. Um but they do have a little secret. Or they do. do right? They do have a defensive yeah. secret. The males do. I guess the females do develop like a little, a little bump on their legs where they would have this special weapon, you could say. Um, but the males develop and grow what's called a spur. So it's basically like a hollow, um, I believe it's keratinous uh, spike, basically, on their leg that they use for defense. And um, the cool thing about it is not only is it a spur, it produce, they produce venom. So they actually inject venom through their spur. And what's kind of interesting is the venom they produce isn't like most venom. It's not necrotic, so it's not necessarily going to like kill the flesh that it's uh, injected into. But it kind of has other effects. I think like a slight like para like paralysis. Um, I've heard it's incredibly painful. Yeah. Like, it's one of the most painful things ever. So it can kill smaller animals. It's not lethal to humans, but it does cause an intense pain. And It's killed dogs, even, mm -hmm. which is crazy. And the kind of cool thing about it is this spur isn't stationary. They actually have the ability to move it. So if it's kind of, most of the time, it's kind of up, like, kind of up against their body. Um, so don't have to worry about hitting anything, and it's out of the way, but they can move it when they're ready to, you know, defend themselves. So it's kind of like a retractable claw, in a sense. Yeah, retractable in the sense that it's not like a cat, where they kind of can, like, sheath it, but they can move it out of the way. Um, it's almost like if you had, like, your thumb. So if you're a platypus, and your thumb is your spur... Right now, this is when it's up and away, but as soon as you need it to defend yourself, you kind of move it, and it's accessible. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a picture of this for, um, yeah. uh, just so people can, can kind of see. And yeah, because we're following a male understand. here, but we can't actually see a spur on its hind legs, because it has two spurs, one on each leg. Um, Try to see if you can pause it. And yeah, it's a good point. In. I'm, I'm interested to see if there is a spot oh, on the males. Oh, wait. There might be. Yeah, okay. 
So it's kind of hard to see, but there's like a slight kind of like oh, sharp the edge there. there. Yeah, so I'm yeah. thinking that might be the spur. Okay. Huh. So at least they do have it. It is present. Yeah. Oh, gotta unpause it. One of the things that I do really find interesting about platypus, though, and Justin's kind of talked about how this is a very weird animal. It's from a it's from a group of animals that historically used to be very diverse, but now there, there's only a couple of them left, and they have very unique niches in you know a very isolated landscape. And so when Europeans first arrived to Australia, you know they were very puzzled by this animal to the point that they thought it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. You know, people were making this up that the taxidermies, they were sewing a bunch of different animals together. This, th there's no way this could have been a real animal. It was a, it was a taxonomous nightmare <laughs> in a sense. But, you know, even then I was looking into some of like the Aboriginal legends around the platypus and they uh -huh. have like special origins for it where, for example, there was a, in one case, it was a, a female duck that got kidnapped by a water rat. Huh. And the the children of the duck and the water rat became a platypus. Uh, that That's one example of a legend. And then another one that I really like is that... Um, the the spirits all all the different animals had their their own totems or their or their groups mm -hmm. and so the birds all had a group the the marsupials all had a group and, and the fish had a group and they were all trying to convince the platypus to join their respective group huh. and guess who the platypus decides to consult with to figure out which one, but the echidna. <laughs> so maybe they recognize there was some sort of connection there. Yeah. Uh, it really goes to show you traditional ecological knowledge. You know, it really can come in, in very surprising ways. And, and there's a lot that we can learn from people that have been living with these animals for a very long time. Um, but the echidna, after, after consulting with the echidna, the platypus decided that it was going to have traits from all three groups and do his own thing. That's really and, cool. Yeah. So the platypus is the spirit. Um, he, he commemorates the great spirit for making all the animals different um, and and respecting the, the wisdom. So it's really cool. I, I just think that's some really nice touch on the on the aboriginal side, because that's not a whole lot of what of what you hear about. Most of what you hear about is discovering it by Europeans. Yeah. And this is kind of cool because it ties into Sir Richard Owen, who I assume you kind of know, because he's the guy bit. who named the dinosaurs, mm -hmm. like the first dinosaurs. And he was very involved in natural history and paleontology in Britain in general. Uh, not the best man, <laughs> <laughs> unsurprisingly, but basically there were two factions when it came to the plat those people that thought that the platypus was a real animal, mm -hmm. is... Uh, Richard Owen was on the side that um, they could, they, they were able to lactate, they could make milk, but they couldn't lay eggs. Mm -hmm. And then there were another group of people that argued that it could lay eggs, but it couldn't produce milk. <laughs> so they're focusing in so, on... Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's an animal that could do both. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, it's just a really interesting, crazy history of just people from an area where there's not any animal like this then encountering it for the first time and trying to say what it is. And it's, you know, it really is just this clade that was only able to survive in this one area due to its isolation and just uh, their ability to specialize into those particular niches because uh isn't it right justin there used to be a lot more monotremes oh yeah there used to be a platyp a prehistoric platypus that was i believe like three three feet in length so it's much bigger than the modern platypus yeah um yeah. and it was really interesting when you brought up the point about these animals that are only found in one particular part of the world they didn't even cross like a lot of um like marsupials and some other animals that are in this you know um area they didn't cross. Do you remember what the line's called? Um, the the line between like oh the Wallace line. The Wallace line, yes. The line that kind of yeah. Yeah. a line. It's not necessarily like a, a literal line, but it's a kind of 
uh, what's the biogeographical line? Is that a good word for it? Yeah, I, I guess we can give a background because we haven't really talked about it. But basically, everybody knows the seven continents. Mm -hmm. When it comes to ecology and, you know, natural history, uh, instead, it's better to use uh, Wallace's biogeographical regions. And Alfred Wallace is somebody who contributed heavily to our understanding of evolution by natural selection. Charles Darwin's obviously more famous. He wrote The Origin of Species. Uh, Wallace also did a lot. He contributed a lot. However, he let Darwin take credit because they knew that it was going to be extremely controversial with the church and everything like that. And Darwin had been writing Origin of Species for a while, and Wallace gave him some extra evidence to, to really push it forward and, and make it as solid of a theory as, as it was to, to be a true scientific theory. Um, so Wallace came up with a bunch of different regions. And so the Wallace line is where the Australian or the Australasian mm -hmm. region, biogeographic region, um, that boundary to the, the Oriental region, which is pretty much like the Indian subcontinent all the way through mainland Southeast Asia down into a bunch of those Indonesian islands. And so there are some animals that cross, uh, for example, Komodo dragon, which we're gonna gotta talk about later at some point they're an animal that that has crossed that line um but yeah the the monotreme at least the modern groups of monotremes because i know monotremes used to be like way more diverse and widespread during the the mesozoic when dinosaurs were around but mm -hmm. um i don't know how which, widespread they were geographically which is a really interesting point to bring up because um when people think of you know mammals especially they really don't think of them existing at all in conjunction with dinosaurs but pretty much all the major mammalian groups diversified prior to the extinction of the dinosaurs like yeah. they didn't become like right at the very end yeah like right but... at the very end um and the platypuses and the monotremes especially or especially the echidna and the platypus are unique because they're like the oldest uh one of the oldest like branching groups of mammals like one of the first like, not really like two branch but well it, it, it you can see it like they yeah. retained what we consider more basal more exactly. primitive traits to other mammals that we consider more derived and yeah. you know that's Which, because of that that earlier ancestry with you know animals that were more reptilian mm -hmm. like i guess there's a theory that the possession of the spur and the venom is actually potentially a more basal mammalian trait that everyone else just lost versus the platypus kind of independently uh, evolving, which, you know, it's just theory, so we, yeah. it's not anything certain, but it's just a really cool um, thought to kind of go through to think that this animal could have be kind of our greatest um, example of kind of what mammals were you know millions and millions and millions of years ago before they kind of diversified yeah and i mean you had a lot of crazy groups like the multi-tuberculates mm -hmm. were a group that went extinct because of the kpg yeah and they were they were a group of mammals that was very much you know they were they were basically like acting like you know fulfilling a lot of niches that rodents do now but rodents hadn't evolved yet so these these multi-tuberculates were were taking those spots and then they went extinct and that allowed rodents to kind of move up and, and take those those spots but you did have some of the the more modern mammal group. i think like primates as a group were i believe maybe so starting to be around so probably rodents were were around in some shape or form they just weren't reached the success that they have now yeah multi-tuberculates um i know bats Bats is a weird one because, like, I think the first bats pop up, like, not long after, but they're, like, fully developed. So it's mm -hmm. like, do we have some proto-bats in the Cretaceous that we haven't found yet? We don't know. Um, but, yeah, we're getting a little off topic here. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> this is, this is uh -huh. We don't want to turn into a, a classic Skeleton Crew stuff, topic, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So um, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get back uh, to our uh, century. Yeah. <laughs> Our, our back back to our regularly scheduled program yeah back to the modern yeah. day but yeah these guys i mean you talk you touched on the electric reception a little bit but these mm -hmm. guys are mostly hunting invertebrates i think a little bit of like small fish and, and things like that but it's it's very much an aquatic based diet yes yeah yeah 
and obviously i think like cray crayfish in particular are pretty important i want to say yeah i I'm not 100 percent sure, so I can't for say for certain, but I would I would agree, yeah. Um, and you can just tell by their body that the way they've got their webbed feet, um, the tail that you know helps them with their swimming, and their bill and everything. They're a very aquatic animal. Um, yeah. They don't venture too far from you know waterways, which is yeah. one of the reasons why they're can kind of be hard to survey and study because they do exist in water and as you can see from that water it's kind of hard to, to look into so if you're on a boat trying to do a visual survey that's not really going to work out very well so one of the ways oh. that they actually do survey them is called using eDNA where they basically take water samples and there's little remnants of you know platypus DNA in the water and that's what they can use to tell oh we have platypus in this waterway um, which has been, you know, really important because the platypus is a really, as weird as it is and as an animal, its status is also kind of weird because it's less, or it's on the IUC, IUC, <laughs> I always say this wrong, IUCN, right? Am I saying it yeah. wrong? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, you know you got okay, it. Okay, right? gotcha. I don't know. I don't know why you like like you're saying it right. But you're oh, just, okay. Like, For some <laughs> reason, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, so they have it listed as near threatened, um, and that was based on I think a paper in 2016. So, a pretty pretty recent one. But the the platypus is weird because its populations aren't super known. Um, in I mean, reference real quick. Well, and I think the other thing, too, because this is an animal that's so water dependent, you also have to remember, like, Australia is pretty dry. Like, yeah. most people know about the outback. And these guys can't live in the outback. Like, no. they are very much restricted to, like, the, the eastern east coast. Exactly. They're Australia. only found they're in the in eastern. They're also in Tasmania. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're in Tasmania as well, the island of Tasmania, where it actually, like, snows. So you'll see, like, platypuses, like, running around in the snow, which is yeah. really cool. Which is really interesting. But, yeah. This is an animal that, yeah. It's it's an Australian animal, but yeah. it's not found in a whole lot of Australia. It's only no. found in select parts. And even within those select parts, it like within a, a just a one river system, the the population can be really really fragmented, just because of um, erosion of the river banks. Because as we've said, the they need a very specific kind of uh, vegetation assembly, we could say, and uh, height above the the water line to make a burrow. So if you have an eroded uh, riverbank, then it could easily be not suitable for platypus uh, burrows and reproduction, essentially. Um, and water quality as a highly aquatic animal, that's going to impact not only the platypus, but what it eats. So if you're in a river system with poor water quality that is impacting the food availability, that's going to impact platypus occupancy and population size hmm. fragmentation i know is a pretty big issue like with, yeah uh, construction of dams yeah construction of dams then they have to get out of the water mm -hmm. yeah although it was interesting they, it, they get out of the water and then they're vulnerable to cars they're vulnerable to foxes or yeah you know feral dogs i did see that something stuff. that said that um bri or bridges that go over um like waterways didn't seem to be that big of a barrier for them, which, you know, to an extent makes sense. There's not necessarily anything in the water aside from like the pillars or something that's directly impacting that waterway. But a lot of animals are sensitive to sound and other, I, I think we could probably say noise pollution and light pollution from cars, because um, a platypus might be sensitive to the vibration of the vehicles. Uh, but apparently, supposedly, it's not that big of a deal as they would expect um but yeah Actually, as... that, that makes me wonder something mm -hmm. are they like i'm thinking of like watercraft like yeah. are they dealing with boat propellers or oh. things like that? that's gonna be or are they that's I, a good I feel question like they're mostly in like small they're in like small streams most of the time aren't they though i guess it, well it they're depends like in... they they'll okay. be in rivers uh creeks and streams so that's kind of different sizes of uh waterways okay. there 
Um, so they have like the same variety that like beavers and otters have. Yeah. In, in that sense of the freshwater environments. I would be interested to see how, that's a good question, how watercrafts impact them. Perhaps maybe they're just, because of their size, yeah. they're not that big of animals, so they're able to... Um, yeah. I haven't, I, I didn't see anything. Most of the conservation yeah. stuff I saw was about the dams. Exactly. When same. I was researching. It was like dams and I think culverts and other um, Makes sense. kind of uh, human-made water water sources, or not water sources, but uh, alterations. Um, but when we were talking about where these platypuses are from and kind of inhabit, I believe what I was reading, because I can't exactly find the paper, but I will verify this, but um, it was saying that in the northern region, they're not as common, they're more common in the southern region, and um, there's the population in Tasmania, and the interesting thing about the Tasmanian population is they're more likely to disperse terrestrial terrestrially than uh, platypuses in the mainland, um, which is really interesting because you'd expect from an aquatic species that their dispersal might be largely or maybe entirely like you know through waterways. Um, but as we've seen, this platypus they're able to go on land. They're not the fastest animal, but they're not like tortoise slow, which I guess is unfair to tortoises, and tortoises can be surprisingly fast. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so it is an interesting difference between the Tasmanian and mainland populations um, is their ability to, or not their ability, but their tendency to disperse terrestrially, so over land, uh, more than the mainland ones. And another interesting difference is Tasmanian platypuses are susceptible to a specific fungi, um, so it causes a disease within them, and I guess that's not something that's seen within the mainland population, which is interesting. Um, so it must be some sort of endemic fungus or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is one of those things that is interesting because the like the Tasmanian devil within Tasmania, obviously, they have the issues of the, um, the facial tumors that kind of spread throughout their populations. Yeah. And, um, it's... and, and it's interesting, like, because de devils will go after platypuses. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm pretty sure they've killed a couple before that we Yeah, reported, I wouldn't be surprised. So it's interesting that they still think that, you know, the, the Tasmanian platypuses still will disperse over terrestrial when you've got mm -hmm. more of that, that native uh, size marsupial predator where whereas it's lacking on the mainland right now yeah and i'd be also interested to see what what other factors um cause that like maybe perhaps tasmania doesn't have and i don't know for certain but maybe there's um like less connected waterways um so there's maybe, like yeah, water systems possible. and maybe they're more like ponds or something that or like rivers that aren't necessarily mm -hmm. as connected so just by necessity they have yeah. to Crawl. Mountain uh, lakes. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so one of the other things in terms of habitat suitability, because we've been talking about, you know, burrow, where they place their burrows in terms of the amount of vegetation nearby and uh, the height above the water line. Um, another factor are is the precipitation during the driest period and the maximum temperature. Um, of, you know, the area that they're in. So, if you know, it makes sense. A platypus is an animal that is aquatic, primarily. So they need an area that has a high amount of precipitation for at least some part of the year. Um, and a spot that doesn't experience, uh, at least within a localized environment, the most extreme uh, heat. Because Australia can get really warm and heat causes evaporation so that can shrink uh water or water systems a little bit so like ponds or anything so for the platypus that's would be very important i think anything else that you can that you want to mention uh oh. no i mean we mentioned the threats pretty well you know i yeah. mean that that ties into you know with their habitat preference as an aquatic animal in a very normally hot and dry area you do have to worry about climate change shrinking your mm. available habitat absolutely that's definitely a concern with the platypus as well as a multitude of other uh, animals in australia that are very reliant on the 
those wetter areas in on along the eastern coast of the continent. Um, so that is something to consider. And we mentioned dams, we mentioned water pollution. You know, a lot of it's all very uh, habitat related. But Justin, do you know of any conservation groups that are really yes. doing a lot to kind of try and protect platypuses? Yeah. So there's actually, and let me let me make sure I'm getting this name right. The Platypus Conservation Initiative. Um, which is a collaborative effort of NGOs, um, state and federal agencies, along with universities as well, that are kind of collaborative, collaboratively working together to conserve the platypus, including studying them. Um, so these are places like, uh, let's see, the Taronga Zoo was uh, one that was mentioned, um, universities within Australia. Um, let me... There's a university right here. Yeah, I think, here. Well, what was it? It's, it's either University of New South Wales or University of... Um, I believe it is... Uni I think that does a lot. Yeah, I want to say it's the University of stuff. New South, well South Wales, I think. Yeah. Let me just open this link real quick to confirm. Because we're, we're scientists here. We like to be exact. Yeah. University we're gonna of have, New South We're going to have all the sources in the description oh, yeah. for people that want to you know just yeah. read everything and and understand where we're, we're getting this from obviously like that's what we do for every video but yes we like to we like to know who our uh who everybody is we're all on the same team of conservation so it's, mm -hmm. it's good to know everybody that's working on different projects yeah and so without outside of australia um you pretty much can't see a platypus they're they don't exist anywhere else and in terms of keeping them captivity that was really difficult I believe they were kept in captivity like one other time outside of Australia um, in the past like 50 years. But the San Diego Zoo Safari Park has two platypus and um, they have their own exhibit in the Australia portion. I've been to the Safari Park. I've been to that portion of the zoo, but I was there like two years before they got the platypuses. So I haven't seen them yet. But um, being an animal that, you know, is largely nocturnal and like spends a lot of time at night they actually have the habitat like they kind of flip their um, perception of time i guess you could say where they have artificial sunlight during the nighttime and then during the the daytime for us they have um kind of you know red lights and things that simulate nighttime for them so that you will actually see them active swimming around and can get the best view of them but yeah, so if you ever want to see a platypus and don't want to travel to Australia and you're not from Australia, the San Diego Zoo Safari Park has platypus that you can see and learn about while you're there. Um, and, you know, being a conservation, a zoo that also is a pretty big, um, you know, partner in a lot of conservation organizations and is a conservation organization in its own, um, they deal a lot, a lot with captive breeding of animals so their platypuses are in really good hands and it's pretty exciting that they're able to keep these animals there yeah captive breeding a lot of education outreach even just you know with um with captive animals you do a lot of just like understanding the anatomy so that mm -hmm. way if there's field research where we have to go out and immobilize something we're not working blindly off of a wild population we have a little bit of an understanding from our captive populations and We've mentioned San Diego Zoo, Safari Park before. You know they are very much interconnected with a lot of conservation, both uh, in the United States and internationally. So mm -hmm. you know it is it is a very good facility for a assisting conservation work. And as you mentioned, the um, you know using captive breeding programs as a way to understand the animal's anatomy, they're also used a lot for understanding their reproduction, which is the case with the platypus, because where I had mentioned that the uh, um, incubation of the eggs to hatching is like about you know 12 days that was something that they learned from captive breeding programs that would have been harder to study in a you know wild population yeah it's going to be hard to stick a camera down a platypus burrow <laughs> exactly and, yeah and, <laughs> and to find the burrow in the first place that. yeah that's, that's so. true I'm sure it's very concealed Well, yeah, yeah I guess uh, it's our lovely uh, little uh, the, yeah. Want to take it to the tier list now? I guess. Well, actually, should we check the um, species uh, the Zoopedia? Oh yes. 
Thank you for reminding me. Let's let's I, let's make sure that they have the uh, you know scientific name right and everything. Yeah, I don't know if the platypus has any interspecies enrichment. I don't know if it does either, and I, I think it really would with what's in the game. Yeah. Why is it not showing? Sure? Okay, we're going to have to do this the old-fashioned way. Scrolling. All right, platypus. Okay, so we've got the correct scientific name, Orthorhynchus. Orthorhynchus and Malphinus. Um, yep, you're threatened. And let's see. Which doesn't it's... necessarily mean it's doing well. Exactly, <laughs> and it's declining, but it is near threatened. Yeah. You know, we have yes. the order. Metatrinitrine, metatrinitrine. Last memory. Yeah. Awesome. Yep, and here we can see that it's all yeah. on Eastern Australia and Tasmania. Um, species data. Yep. And then, yep, a few venomous yeah. mammals. And then the. Uh, uh, yeah, so no interspecies yeah. enrichment, which, which was makes sense. to be expected. I mean, a lot yeah. of the yeah, a lot of the bigger animals, like, they wouldn't really yeah. overlap, like, you know, things like can red kangaroo, emu, Bennett's wallaby, I mean, even koala, like, they're not really using that same sort of, like, riparian, like, they'll use it to drink, mm -hmm. but, you know, that, that, that's about it, so it kind of makes sense that, not, I mean, the really only other one I can think of is, like, saltwater crocodile, maybe, but yeah. I know they're a bit more, like, in the north, so. And um, from a, obviously, from, like, a zoo perspective, these animals, from at least from what I know, they're not housed with other animals, so they're kind of kept solitary. Or not solitary, because they're with other platypus, but um, not with other species. So that, that checks out. Yeah, All right. I mean, when you're only, when there's only one zoo that's allowed to have them outside of the uh, <laughs> Australia. country of Australia, I'm sure you're a bit, you know... <laughs> you're a bit, you're a bit no hesitant. Up by exactly. With the wrong animal. Yeah. yeah. Um... But yeah, so I guess uh, so it's a tier list? to the tier list. Yep. Okay, um, I am gonna quickly check my phone because I forgot what Lane told me his vote was, just in case. But you start rattling mm. off. What's your what's your case study for okay. the platypus? All right, for the platypus. Okay, so it's an animal that I really love. Um, so I want to place it as high as I can, to an extent. <laughs> but we have to be fair in terms of. Uh, everything about it. Um, to me, the biggest issues with it are just the some of the movements seem kind of off. Uh, just in like the hind legs when it's kind of moving. Um, so I would place it probably in A tier behind the um, the southern white rhino. I think. Because I think visually, aside from that, like the model looks great, the swimming looks great, um, the way it kind of moved its bill on the ground, it's great animations, uh, the presence of the spur. So that's that's what I'm gonna go with. A tier behind the rhinoceros. I'm gonna disappoint you, Justin. What do you think? I'm putting in <laughs> B. I think like yeah, okay. no, it's okay. like it's got it's got good like texturing for sure, and like the spur is nice. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think like the the way that it waddled. Obviously, like they're not supposed to waddle that much, but with the way that the game works, they're going to be waddling a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, I mean, obviously there's some locomotions that we haven't like fully done because like the Okapi uses a zebra rig. Um, mm -hmm. I think the the white rhino uses the hippo rig, but I feel like with the with the platypus, just the jank is so noticeable. That's fair. That yeah. I'm going to put it in B. I'm still going to put it above the red fox, though. <laughs> I, I think it's better than the red fox. I agree um, with that, yeah. And Lane also put it in B, so he's the, <laughs> the tiebreaker in there. Um, so I'm sorry for disappointing you, but... That's yeah. fine. I, I You know, B <laughs> above the red fox is better than being B behind the red fox. <laughs> <laughs> it's B for baby for you, because that's your baby until the kid that gets added. Um, exactly. So, yeah, that's the tier list for now, but we do want to address something. We are actually not going to be jumping to the wheel right now, and 
I know the wheel's like a nice little fun activity where it, it throws an element of randomness into it, but just because our channel is really small right now and it hasn't really picked up, uh, we do want to cover some animals in particular because we think that it could help boost the channel if we're covering some that are a bit more sensational or a bit more controversial. So we're going to do those couple of ones uh, next. We're not going to reveal which ones those are because we don't know the exact order, but we do have some ideas of some species that we want to do next. Um, it's just something that we noticed after doing our rhino video. Our rhino video did a lot better than all of our other videos, and, and we'd like to replicate that and, and retain higher viewership. And then once that happens, uh, obviously we want to go back to the wheel. We, we enjoy that, that element of randomness with the wheel, but... We're going to be taking a bit of a break from the wheel, so just want to let people know that there's going to be no spinning of the wheel for this episode, and uh, there won't be for the next uh, few episodes. But hopefully you guys are excited for which animals that we want to cover, because we think that these animals in particular, they've very often been misrepresented, especially by a lot of the other youtube channels that do wildlife content so we're going to be helping to set things right and give a, a more accurate uh outlook on on those particular species because we think that they really need it right now um especially yeah. just they you know they are of conservation concern and it's not okay to really dunk on um a species that really is only doing poorly because of humans and uh and trying to blame the animal for it that's that's not really okay in our eyes so that's that's our future plans I uh, hope everybody understands. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Justin, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd just say with that, we're, we are going to have fun with it. And when we do yeah. have the animal chosen, we're going to be kind of giving you some hints so you can kind of try to piece it together. So it'll be a, it'll be a big reveal when it does happen. Yeah, uh, but yeah. You make sure to follow us on uh, our Twitter page, which is just at WildlifeWire. And that's where we'll be giving some updates. We also post interesting current events to new scientific articles and sometimes we'll post some funny memes here and there which you also see on the youtube community tab but yeah so we've got that plan we've got uh, a couple other uh, videos that should hopefully come out before this one showing that we're kind of diversifying out casting a wider net on some other games and things like that but if you guys have any recommendations of things you'd like to see definitely leave it in the comments because we'd love to mm -hmm. consider it for sure so Absolutely. with all that, we are the Wildlife Wire, signing off. See you next time.